through the waiting room. Welcome to everybody. So we'll get started around 3.03 to 3.04. We just still have people coming in. Welcome. Well, we're just going to get we're going to get started on our introductions. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our fifth annual Wisdom with Women speaker series. Um, this speaker series was actually started in 2019 uh, to celebrate the 19th Amendment of the women's uh, first right to vote. Um, we are now in year five of working through this program, and we're so happy that we still um, have continued. Uh, continued it. Uh, this program aims to to get financial fi financial female professionals getting free education out to our business community and our clients. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ali Kemp. I am the CEO and an advisor here at Financial Insights Wealth Management. And uh, Financial Insights, if you don't know, uh, we specialize in wealth management and retirement planning. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're really happy to have Amanda Burroughs here today, who is a lead advisor at Financial Insights, as well as our head of retirement planning. Uh, Amanda has over a decade in the financial industry since 2009. Her early experiences ignited a deep-seated career passion. Her ultimate reward stems from guiding clients through major life changes with informed financial decisions and fostering financial education. Cer uh, she is a certified financial planner and a chartered socially responsible investment counselor. Her expertise encompasses a ho holistic view of financial planning, taking into account ethical considerations. Her academic background is a BA in psychology from Washington State University, and this adds a unique dimension to her financial insights. When she's not shaping brighter futures, Amanda dedicates her time to her family, and her family consists of stay-at-home dad Richard, daughter Ruby, and son Rico. The family of four likes to spend their time skiing, fishing, hiking, boating, swimming, and exploring new destinations. And she infuses the same passion into her leisure pursuits as she does her work. We're really happy to have Amanda here today speaking on Financial Planning 101, Please stick around at the end for a Q&A session um, that you can have with Amanda. And uh, we will hopefully stay on time. Um, we should be done by four o'clock. So Amanda, uh, please take it away. And thank you for joining us. Wow, thank you, Allie. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. This is my third Wisdom with Women series. And I'm hoping to have zero technical difficulties and get to everybody's questions uh, in a timely manner. So today, we're just going to be really scratching the surface on financial planning. I'm going to try and cover everything within the hour and leave room for questions, which really means it's going to be surface level. This will be perfect for someone who's just starting out um, and thinking about financial planning for the first time, for those of you who just need a refresher because you don't think about this all the time, and for those of you who are working with an advisor, maybe you have been for a long time. But are you and your advisor really speaking the same language? Um, I recently, funny story about this, I had a client recently who's almost retired, uh, has been working with a financial advisor for a long time, and we were talking about his investments and how he's very conservative. And he said, conservative, I thought it was a liberal. And I thought, oh, this is a moment for me to back up and think about the word conservative and what that means in my world and my industry versus what that means politically, which is what this client was kind of associating that word with. So um, I think it's really good to kind of get a refresher. Um, we're going to go through some terminology that's commonly used in my field as well. 
Okay, what is financial planning? So financial planning is gonna encompass your goals, your goals in life, your budgeting and cash flow, your risk management, that's gonna include insurance, your debt management, so that's gonna be any mortgage, um, student loans, any debt that you might incur, investments and investment planning, and as well as your estate plan. So estate plan is just kind of a term that's used loosely used in our industry, which will include any will, power of attorney, trust, basically what do you want to happen when you die? And, um, and so we'll talk about that as well. So those are kind of the, the topics we're gonna cover today. Now that you're planning focus by age, I wanted to kind of point this out. It's not set in stone, but I wanted to think about um, planning because most people think they only need a financial plan uh, maybe a year or two before they retire or maybe even when they're just about to retire. That's usually when people contact our office, but we should be thinking about this a lot earlier. Um, I recently learned that money habits are developed by age seven. And this Beth Koblinger, uh, Kobliner, I don't know how to say her last name. She uh, She's a, a well-known uh, industry professional, and she started to focus on kids. She has a website and, and sort of a game that she's developed and some steps called Making Your Kid a Money Genius, which I thought was really interesting. My kids are still too young. They're two and five. But when my kid is seven, and that's for, what it's for is for kids age seven and eight, I'm definitely going to take a look. Um, and what she'll tell you is that kids are more perceptive than we think. They know what's happening at the grocery store. They're observing their parents talk about money. They know that it, it costs money to get things that they want. They see you swipe the credit card. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really good idea to get your kids involved and start talking about it at a young age. Um, I don't have a magic age that you should do that, but just know that they are, uh, they're little sponges. And by age seven, um, Beth is saying that kids have developed their money habits. <laughs> uh, I also recently learned about high school students and what they can do if we're not teaching enough financial education in our school systems, if you believe that for your kids, there's a company called Stukent and they have a mimic personal finance simulation. And so what that does, is it's almost kind of like a video game. Kids can practice budgeting, they can practice investing, and they'll be going through the tools and, and trying to build their own kind of life situation for how to be an adult. And then something will happen in the game or in the simulation. Oh, life happens, you lost your job, or life happens, your car needs new tires, you know? And so it, it, it allows kids to practice real life situations. So I thought that was really cool to share um, because when we're birthed to age 18, there's not a whole lot that kids themselves can do. Um, but the parents, what we should be focusing on for those kids in that age range is college savings. Maybe we're talking about a UTMA, which is a Uniform Trust to Minors account. That's basically an account where there's an adult who's the custodian, but it's really the kid's money. And that could be a bank account or investment account. And then of course, kids can start with a piggy bank and physical money. They tend to learn best that way. And then for those kids who are working under the age of 18, maybe that's a custodial Roth IRA. Now, a really rare situation of that, um, at least in the Pacific Northwest, um, would be your kid to, to have a job at a really young age, but maybe a child actor uh, or actress might have income. Um, there's a few rare situations that your kid might have income, and then you'd be able to contribute to a Roth IRA and help them save. And we're gonna talk about Roth IRAs later. So that's birth to age 18. Those are the considerations and the planning considerations for that age group. Now age 18 to 30, um, I have bolded goals. We really wanna think about what we want out of life. It's time to start being an adult. Um, you know, We're still pretty young at age 18, but we're probably gonna to wanna to work on building our credit score in the US. Your credit score is everything. That's how you're able to buy a first home. Uh, you might need financing in your business. Uh, for various reasons, you need to have a good credit score. And at age 18, you want to start building that. Um, also, good savings habits. 
good budgeting skills. We'll, we'll be practicing that with your first jobs. Um, retirement investing. Yes, you should start as early as you possibly can. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Buying a first house and then also insurance. And that's different types of insurance. So now we need to price out and make sure we have adequate coverage for a house if we have one, health care, disability, uh, and potentially life insurance, especially if we have debt, if we've, if we've purchased a home, and especially if we have kids. Now, age 30 to 50, now we're more focused on debt management, on life insurance, especially if we have kids. Um, but we might have a partner, we, might, we still probably have some a lot of debt, 30 to 50, so that's where life insurance comes in. Um, we're going to try and accelerate our investing and savings because these are probably our peak earning years. We're probably at the top of our career, or we're getting there, um, which means this is, the, this is the time that we can invest and save the most. Um, it's also a time when our expenses are probably really high, so that's hard, that's the juggle. Um, we have, you know, competing interests and needs at this age group. Um, we'll think about health savings accounts because you'll start thinking about um, your later years and how you're going to afford health care. And height of your career, which I already mentioned, tax management. So that, that comes along with if you're in the height of your career and you're earning the most money that you might earn, um, let's be considerate of taxes. Do we have to reduce your taxes um, because you're earning too much income? Are there strategies that we should use for that? And then lastly, of course, is Roth IRA, which really Roth IRA and all of these, I should have added that age 18 to 30. I did kind of in parentheses, but Roth IRA should be in every single category. <laughs> if you're a planner, you're going to talk about HSAs and Roth IRAs. Um, and then from age 50 to 70, we're closer to our distribution phase. Um, so maybe our investments change a little bit and maybe get start to get more conservative. So that's a different phase. We might be moving from our accumulation phase of life where we're trying to accumulate as much as we can to maybe we'll start distributing from our assets. So that's completely different. And we want to try and minimize debt, um, maybe. So again, none of this is set in stone, but maybe minimize debt. Um, tax management is always on top of mind in, in that age group, especially. Health savings accounts, that's what HSA stands for. Um, and then always Roth IRA. Either maybe we're contributing or maybe in lower income years, we're talking about converting more to a Roth IRA. And then age 70 to 105, I had to put 105 because actually my oldest client is 105 years old. We are living a lot longer um, these days and I have a 105 year old client. So this is usually a distribution phase. Some folks are working into their 70s and 80s and I think that's great, but for the most part, um, even if you do plan to work till 70 or 80, we have to have a backup plan in case you can't. So in case there's a health reason or in case your job just isn't available to you anymore, we need to plan for this being your distribution phase. We need to plan for tax management. Charitable giving is usually top of mind more so than the earlier years. Um, we need to be aware of financial scamming, right? So this age group especially is just targeted for phishing scams, for, um, you know, everyone's kind of attacking you left and right, either in email or phone calls. So that's something we really have to, to protect you from. And then healthcare and long-term care. So those are, those are the big top of minds for that age group, age 70 to 105. And what I didn't add here, but what I'll add um, is just your estate plan. Making sure that whatever you want to happen when you leave this earth happens exactly the the way that you want it. So those are the planning considerations. Some popular goals um, would be early retirement or regular retirement, owning a home, limiting debt, maybe vacations. Some people really want to travel, but goals in the planning process is probably the most important in my opinion, because if you examine these goals in depth, I promise you, you will start to relieve your anxiety. If you're someone who has you know, financial anxiety, am I saving enough? Am I doing enough? You need to just go back to step one and look at your goals and define them. Especially in your 30s and 40s, you will have so many competing interests applying pressure on your decision-making. 
I talked about this a little bit before. We might have high debt with a mortgage. We might have childcare costs. We might have elderly parent costs. We might be trying to save for retirement, try to save for kids' college, maybe their braces. We have so many competing financial obligations at once. We'll try and help you, you know, prioritize which ones. And and the thing that I want you to think about too, um, because sometimes when we're in our mid thirties, even I meet with clients who are in their mid thirties who are just thinking, you know, I'm so stressed out. I can only save this much for retirement. What I want you to remember is that saving for retirement is a marathon. It's about starting early and saving consistently through your working years. If you can't save 20% of your income right now, that is okay. So I'm, I'm hoping to relieve a little bit of that stress. At the same time, I, I do want to say that we've got to consistently do it and we have to start early. Okay. And another important consideration with goals is that they're specific to you. Some clients want to retire early and some don't. I have one client who wanted to retire at a normal retirement age, um, which, which for him at that time, the social security retirement age was 65 years old. So he did not, for his health, want to continue working in his high stress career. And what he wanted to do is work at McDonald's. He really wanted to work at McDonald's because he wanted to work with young people. He felt that young teenagers made him feel young. And that was also another way that he could supplement income for things he wanted to do. He wanted to go on cruises. He wanted to do, you know, little extra things that he didn't know if his financial plan, had, you know, if he'd really saved enough. And we tested some strategies. He was kind of on the cusp. And he wanted to use that as kind of a youth outreach. He wanted to be able to influence these young people working at McDonald's and be a good influence on them, show them how to be, you know, show them how to save for things that they want in life, teach them about his career path and how he did it. Um, and he really enjoyed that. So everyone's different. And um, some people want to retire early. I have plenty of clients who want to retire early. And there are ways that you can do that. It's not our jobs as financial planners to pass on any judgment. It's our job to get to know what you really want. And then that way we can teach you how to get there or guide you how to get there. That's my favorite part about the job is that I get to learn so many different, learn about so many different kinds of people and what they want out of life. And it's just all, it's all beautiful. Um, how to save. So we save toward the goal, obviously. Um, we have to track our expenses, plan a budget, shop smarter, and stop unnecessary spending. Um, the top one is probably the most important. What I have seen in my career is that a small hole can sink a great ship. That, that saying um, really applies to finance. In my observations, the number one detractor for smart people in budgeting is the little things and especially young people, because it takes a while to learn this lesson. It takes a while to realize that your pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks every day for $4.75. For a year, that's $1,000, $1,733, really. That's a round trip flight to Rome. That's, you know, I mean, you can buy a bulk bag of coffee at um, Costco. I think it's like $18. So anyway, Stopping that unnecessary spending or these little feel good in the moment um, spends can make a huge difference. Warren Buffett, in, in fact, once bought a company where the CEO counted the squares in a 500 roll toilet paper roll to see if he was being cheated. And he was. This is kind of a famous Warren Buffett. But the point being, and I don't think you should go home and count your toilet paper squares, but the point being is just to pay attention and make sure that you're not kind of falling into the consumerism trap and doing these little expenses every day that don't make sense. And then you can't do your vacation to Rome because of it. Okay, where should my money go? This is, this is just kind of one example and I'm gonna do another example um, because people budget in different ways, but every financial planner is gonna say, if you don't have an emergency fund, if you're of working age and you're supporting yourself and you don't have an emergency fund, which is either three or six months of living expenses, you pretty much need to stop what you're doing to build that fund. 
Now, three months is for maybe a couple where both of you are employed. Three months is okay for your bare minimum savings. Six months would be for someone like myself. So I'm the, I'm the sole income earner of my house. My husband's not working. He's taking care of the kids. He's not working outside the home. He's definitely working harder than me because he's taking care of my two kids. But um, I need to have six months because if something were to happen to my income, that's that's more of a detriment to the family um, because we don't have another income to, to help supplement. So either three or six months living expenses, fund that account first. Now we want to move to our retirement or HSA health savings account eligible for employer match. So if you're employed and you have the option of a 401k or a health savings account where your employer will match whatever you put in, that is free money on the table. You have to at least go there next, right? To pick up that 3%, that 5% to as much as they're gonna max. Now, or as much as they're gonna match. Now, hopefully you can afford to do that. Now, if you have to stop there, that's fine. Hopefully you don't. Hopefully we can move on to start paying down loans. But um, for, the, for the most part, uh, we wanna make sure that we do at least the match and then the next step we want to do is pay down higher interest rate loans. That's going to be credit cards. That's going to be, and, and I say anything greater than 7%, that's kind of a rule of thumb. Although I understand that today's interest rate environment, a 30-year mortgage might be above 7%. And in which case, we might not be able to aggressively pay that down right now. And in fact, we shouldn't because we might be able to refinance in a year or two. So I would not... Um, you know, this rule of thumb is, is a little bit more flexible and we'll go into debt a little bit later. Um, but that's the next step is we want to make sure that we don't have credit card debt that can be at 21 percent, 22 percent. And that's how people get into trouble is if we don't attack the higher interest rate loans that we have. So after we've done that, hopefully we can move on then we can maximize contributions to health savings accounts and retirement accounts. So now we can add more money to health savings and retirement. And I will put a caveat in here as well is um, you might have another short-term goal that you need to save for. Maybe a down payment, maybe, um, you know, maybe we have to kind of squeak in some kids' education costs in here. That would kind of go in this, in this area as well. And that's where working with your financial planner kind of diving into your goals is important. Then we attack lower interest rate loans. And then um, maybe on top of that, after we attack lower interest rate loans, not a mortgage, um, then we look at individual retirement accounts and taxable investment accounts. That's where we save kind of our extra money. So that's, that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Remember, it doesn't fit for everybody. There's no one size fits all, but that's a good rule of thumb of where should my money go? And a common question that I get for my young savers, for my people who are starting out in their careers. And then how to budget during the working years. Um, the CFP board will say that you shouldn't spend more than 28% of your income on housing. Um, 15% for long-term goal, that's retirement basically. So maybe 15 of your income, 15% of your income goes towards retirement and then 20% of your income goes to short-term goals um, while you're starting out. So that's maybe saving for a house, um, that may be saving for a car in this example. And then what I don't have on here is the remaining 37% would be for daily living expenses, food, gas, et cetera. Um, this is an oversimplified example. Just, just kind of <laughs> take note, every person is different and it depends on your goals and income level. Uh, for high income earners, as an example, 37% on daily living is probably gonna be way too high and 15% saving for your retirement might be too low or for your long-term goals might be too low. And for those who, who are wanting to retire early, we definitely need to accelerate the 15% right? That's not going to be enough if you're trying to retire early. And then for those starting out your career, maybe 28% for housing is not realistic. In the Pacific Northwest, our housing costs are really high. Maybe there's no way you can have a roof over your head with 28% housing. Your budget's going to be a little difficult, but that, that might be the reality. So these are not, you know, set in stone. And something that I want to just kind of point out, um, 
about this 28 to 30 per 36 percent debt to income ratio is um I'm going to go back. So 28% for housing, but then 36% for total debt. So that's kind of the rule of thumb. If you think about debt, meaning mortgage, so includes housing, so mortgage, maybe car, maybe um, you have credit cards or student loans, 36% is what we want your maximum debt to income ratio to be. So just because you qualify for debt at an institution, at a bank, or at a car dealership, does not mean you can afford the debt. Debt to income ratio is also just a guideline. If you have, you know, really expensive, if you have, you know, living expenses that are exceptionally high for whatever reason, childcare could be a big one, then you might not be able to afford 36% of your debt to income ratio. So there, it, I don't have, you know, I don't have a set in stone rule on this. Um, and then my personal bias is that I don't love a detailed budget, um, just to be honest. <laughs> I like to set my savings amounts, create separate accounts for each one, and let clients spend what is left over. So what that means is if we have a travel fund, if we have a retirement account, if we have a you know repair the roof account, when you get your paycheck, your money goes towards your everyday spending account, that's a checking account, then it may be a portion of your funds, maybe 100 bucks a month goes towards travel, maybe another 200 bucks a month goes towards repairing the roof. Maybe if we know the goals that you have, it's really nice to have accounts set up for each one. And then if you have money left over, you can spend that. That's discretionary. I would not go so far as obsessing about changing your light bulbs to reduce your electricity bill. Although I do admire clients who do, remember the Warren Buffett example, right? He likes that CEO uh, that's obsessive and that's fine. But I think instead, if you're in your working years, that time should be spent increasing your income potential through higher education, through workshops, networking, honing your skills to make more income, unless you really find joy in the little details like that. Um, that that's not what I recommend. I'm not the um, you know, I'm not that type of CFP. <laughs> uh, now in retirement, it's a different story. Um, I will say, well, you're in the distribution phase and you've already made your income and you're not working, go ahead and obsess over the light bulb that will help you reduce your electricity bill. <laughs> That's fine because then maybe we can take less from your investments and that, and that will pay off. But um, I think when you're in your working years, um, you know, your time is, you can only go so far with your budget. We can't live off of nothing, even if we try. I think your time is better spent trying to maximize your income. So what can you do to boost your career uh, and make more? Uh, that, that would be my preference. So uh, your monthly budget is just a list of your monthly expenses, both consistent and discretionary. And I recommend you look at each paycheck at least monthly. Your net worth, um, if anybody ever asks about net worth or you hear us talking about it, that's just your assets minus your liabilities. And it is common sometimes to have a net worth that is negative, especially if you have student loans and a mortgage and uh, whatever, and you freshly have all of this debt and um, you don't have that high paying job yet then you might have a negative net worth and that's okay. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll try and not have that later in life. But if you're 18, 19, or even if, even in your 30s and you have a negative net worth, that's actually pretty common. So let's talk about debt for a second um, because there are some rules of thumb that I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure everybody really knows about. Um, the first one, APR, that's your annual percentage rate versus interest, APR includes costs and fees. So when you're, when you're, you know, getting debt, you're getting a loan, um, or you're getting a credit card, make sure you pay attention to that APR number. That's, that's the true cost of borrowing. Now credit score, we talked about at age 18, we're going to start, you know, maybe letting kids get a credit card and practice, um, you know, improving their credit score. And we want to make sure we follow the 30% rule, unless this is outdated, which it's been a while since I worked at a bank, but the 30% rule is, um, you know, if I'm brand new, actually, I had a client uh, who went through a bankruptcy, and I did have to teach her this 30% rule from scratch because it had just been so long since she's thought about credit cards and, um, 
you know, and building her hers back up again, because it's not an old rule. You didn't have to use this 30% rule. It's fairly new. Um, she went through a bankruptcy basically because of an estate situation and siblings suing each other. It got really, really bad, went through bankruptcy, um, got a credit card, got approved for a credit card, but at a limit of $1,000. And at her income level and her just lifestyle level, she could easily spend that in a day. And I had to teach her that you really should only spend 30% of your limit before paying it off. And that's how the credit bureaus, the three credit bureaus have decided, um, this is how we analyze how responsible someone is and what their credit score will be. So, and it seems preposterous, but we've got to follow these rules. So you spend $300 and then pay it off. Make sure you have auto pay on for at least the minimum payment so you never miss a payment. And then after you approve yourself for a little while, you ask to increase the credit limit. So she, she had to learn that even though she had $1,000, she could not max it out. She couldn't spend $1,000 even if she's paying it off. She thought, well, well, what I'll do is I'll spend $1,000 every week and keep paying it off and that'll increase my credit score and it didn't because what she needed to do was follow that 30% rule and then apply for more for a higher line of credit. And that's what you wanna do when you're just starting out. And sometimes they give it to you without you even applying. They say, hey, guess what? This $1,000 is now 5,000. So that's your new credit limit. So now 30% of 5,000 is what you wanna spend up to your credit, you know, on your credit card. So that's the 30% rule. And then how to structure a loan. So, I was just talking um, not too long ago about preparing for a rainy day with a new college grad who just who just got her first job. She was in her 90 day um, you know, probation period at this job and she wanted to buy a car. She could afford a car and she was really great at saving. So she got, I'll do a 12 month car loan. So I pay it off in 12 months. That'll be the terms of my loan. And what I had to explain to her was actually what you wanna do is find the lowest interest payment for this loan, the lowest interest, and then a longer term loan. So you wanna get maybe a closer to a five year loan because that had the lowest payment. So her payment was maybe half of what the one year loan would be, actually way more than that. I don't remember the numbers. So, and the reason, and with no prepayment penalty. And then you can still pay off this loan in 12 months. So what you do, is you're preparing for the rainy day. If something ever happened with her job, she would be stuck with that higher payment because she got a 12-year loan. And then that could really be a detriment to her finances and to her budget. So instead, we want to have the lower payment. Even if it's a five-year loan, guess what? If there's no prepayment penalty, you still make those extra payments to principal and you still pay it off in 12 months like planned you can still do that. You can still aggressively attack your debt, even if it's a five-year loan. And that's what we want to do. Um, when and how to pay off debt, um, that's another common question. We want to start with loans for depreciating assets first. So credit cards, highest interest, that's easy. Pay those off first. Your car, that also might be a higher interest rate. And your cars do not appreciate in value. They go down in value. So your car is going down in value and you're paying interest on it. So let's pay that one off. Let's pay off student loans. And then last but not least, your home, because your home is going to appreciate, meaning it will increase in value over time. So we want to attack debt for depreciating assets. Your home loan is okay because the underlying asset will appreciate. And, um, you know, kudos to those of you who bought a house or refinanced your house in the last few years when rates were low. Maybe you got two and a half, three percent on your mortgage. And now you can earn interest on your cash, on your emergency savings, even to the tune of four and five percent for bank accounts. That's what we want to see. That's a perfect mix. Um, so anyway, there's less of an argument for paying off your mortgage when you have two and a half, three percent interest. And then if you're really in, in trouble um, and you need to turn around your credit, this is a website for the credit counseling um, you might find helpful. And then here are some budgeting resources. So free online budgeting tools, Nerd Wallet, we've got Quicken, Smart Asset, um, some apps I've used before. I've used Mint, Good Budget, Every Dollar, 
honeydew. I have not used any of these. Really, I've only used mint, um, but that might be a good resource for you if you're somebody who likes to track things and see in real time. It is a good idea to check your bank account pretty frequently, um, especially for scams. It's all too common these days. And then definitely look at your pay stubs at least once a month. Payroll is done by humans and humans make mistakes sometimes. Um, I even have a personal example where I was overpaid by my company. Now, I just thought they really loved me. I didn't, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really understand um, that I needed to pay that money back. But when payroll caught that error, I did have to end up paying that money back. Um, so pay attention if you're overpaid or underpaid, because you will have to rectify that um, one way or another. Okay, that's debt. Now let's talk about taxes. What do you want to think about? So when, when I say, okay, part of financial planning, CFP 101, is we consider taxes, what does that mean? Um, we want to pay attention to tax-free investment strategies, know what's out there to invest in a tax-free way, which the three most popular are health savings accounts. That growth in the investment is tax-free if used for healthcare costs. Roth IRAs. Roth 401ks, Roth, anything with the word Roth, that is tax-free if you follow the rules in re for retirement. And then 529 plans, um, that's tax-free for education. So know what tax-free strategies exist. Pay attention to tax-deferred investment strategies, especially in those high-income years. So if you're making, if you're in the 32% tax bracket, 37% tax bracket, it might make sense to in invest more, you know, definitely pay attention to traditional 401ks and IRAs. Um, those products are tax deferred, which means when you put your money into them, uh, you don't pay tax on that money. So even though you might have earned 30,000 of income, if you put 30,000 into your 401k, you don't pay tax on that. The tax actually is paid when you withdraw in retirement. So that can, that can drastically reduce your tax bill. Um, so it, but it depends on where you are in life and what your taxes look like and be mindful of capital gains tax. So if I have an investment account and I purchase a stock and it appreciates by 50% and I sell that stock, don't forget, you'll get a 1099 at the end of the year. This is in a taxable account and you'll have to pay cap capital gains on that. Um, plan for home and rental sale taxes. So when it comes to real estate, the rule of thumb there is just keep any home improvements and keep those receipts. Because what you'll wanna do when you go to sell that home um, is you'll wanna use those improvements against, uh, or in addition to, to what you paid for the home to increase the cost basis. You'll have to pay tax on the difference between the cost basis and the sale price. And if your home is gonna appreciate each year, which hopefully it does, although, real estate markets move the same way as any other market. You get a $250,000 freebie if you've lived in the home two out of the last five years. And if you're a married filing joint couple, that's $500,000 that you get of a freebie. So if your home appreciates by 500 grand and you've lived in it for the past five years, you don't pay capital gains on that 500 grand. Um, but still keep all of those expenses because you might need them one day for when you go to sell your home. So that's taxes. And then, man, there are some really cool um, employer benefits out there right now. One of them being a dependent care flexible spending account. And during the pandemic, they really raised the amount that you could save in these types of accounts. But basically what a dependent care FSA is, is you can contribute to the FSA and then reimburse yourself from that account each year for childcare. So I, I, when my husband is working, I have daycare expenses for my daughter. And you can contribute up to $5,000 per household in 2023. Um, and then that money, I just reimburse myself. I just submit the receipts for my daycare expenses, reimburse myself, and that's, that's tax-free. For, for daycare. So that would be a, that's another way to just kind of pay attention to cool accounts that are out there. And as an example, if you're in the 32% tax bracket, that's a $1,600 tax savings just for putting $5,000 into this dependent care FSA and then reimbursing yourself. So 
Um, that's what we're looking for when we're considering taxes. Now, I told you I was going to highlight HSA and Roth IRAs because if there's anything you walk away from today, it's these two types of accounts. So a health savings account is a triple tax-free account, meaning the money you put in, you can deduct from your income immediately. Withdrawals are tax-free and the growth is tax-free. So the only rule you have to kind of follow, well, there's many rules you have to follow, but the big one is the ex you have to spend it on healthcare. So any healthcare bills you get in the future, including Medicare costs, um, you can use this HSA account. So it's really, it's a really great account to have. Um, contributions are going to grow tax-free. You must invest. And especially if you have a long-term time horizon, you should invest. And you have to have a high deductible health plan. There are, you know, there are maximums to think about. But if there's a, a type of account to look up for yourself, it's see if you can contribute to an HSA. The only caveat I will say there is um, you also have to do a price comparison for that high deductible plan. If you're someone that needs a lot of health care, um, you might not get as much out of a high deductible health care plan. You might need a different plan that covers more, and that's understandable, but, but something to look into. Another account to look into is a Roth IRA, Roth 401k, Roth, we're Rothing everything now. Uh, with Secure 2.0, it's just on the tip of everyone's tongue is a Roth. And those accounts are tax-free if you follow the rules. Um, so earnings and qualified withdrawals are, are tax-free. The two rules there are really the five-year rule. You want to have the account for five years. And then the other one is you want to be 59 and a half, same as any retirement account. And then withdrawals are completely tax-free. Um, there's a couple other flexible flexible points. Um, you can withdraw your contributions at any time without penalty. So if I contribute ten thousand and it grows to twelve thousand, um, my contributions will always be without penalty, no matter how old I am. So my ten thousand I can pull out, um, but you you won't want to touch your your interest. Otherwise, you're going to have a penalty. And you can use your funds in retirement for whatever you want tax free. So you don't have to use it for healthcare, college, although you can, and many do. You can use it forever for whatever you want. Um, so another type of account to figure out how you can get monies into, especially while you're young. Um, so let's talk about investing. So that's tax. Let's talk about investing. Um, and let me see how I'm doing with time. Oh my gosh. All right, I'm gonna do this. Let's talk about investing. Stocks. What's a stock and what's an equity? What's the difference? Guess what? They're the same thing. They, that just means ownership in a company. If I own 500 shares of Google, that means I have 500 shares of that company. I'm a part owner. Bonds or fixed income, those are used interchangeably. Those are loans used by companies, municipalities, states, and governments. So if I own a bond, someone else wants debt, and they're going to pay me interest for it. So that's another common type of investment is a bond. And bonds are typically used for their income. Mutual funds is a professionally managed group of stocks or bonds or money markets or, or all three of them. So mutual funds is pretty much, that's a term used. Um, and they usually have ticker symbols that end in an X. That's a term for uh, professionally managed group of stocks, bonds. Or, or a combination of everything. Now an ETF, those are popular nowadays. That stands for exchange traded fund. That's a pooled investment security. The only difference between that and a mutual fund, they're typically passive and they trade like a stock, which means you can trade them real time during the stock market hours. An index is also another common term used um, that measures the price performance of a basket of securities. A common index you might hear of is the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, so those are used to kind of take a temperature of the economy. It's just 500 stocks, U.S. stocks. That's the S&P 500, and that's an index. Now, a money market, and we typically in the investment world compare ourselves to different indices. So that's kind of how we uh, take a look at how we're doing uh, in different sectors. Now, money markets are the purchase and sale of short-term debt. Um, they offer higher interest rates than traditional savings, typically. 
a CD or a certificate of deposit. That's a savings product that earns interest for a fixed period of time. So you might hear six month CD, which means you put your money in this product for six months and then you get whatever guaranteed interest they're offering. If you try and touch your money before six months, there's usually a penalty. Now dividends, that's just money an investor receives for owning shares of a company or stock or equity. So those are all interchangeable. They mean the same thing. So interest is either what you're paying to a lender or what you're earning for your savings deposit or investments. And they're simple and compound. Compound is our favorite in this industry because what that means is that your interest is earning interest, right? That's what we want. That's how we get long-term savings. Your dividends reinvest, your interest reinvests, right? Um, so that's how we grow wealth over time. And then capital gains and losses, that's how much your investment went up or down typically. That's what we look at is, is it realized or unrealized? That means, did you sell it or have you not sold it yet? So common terms in our industry. Um, risk, it's important to know your appetite for risk. Um, you can't say no risk in this industry. Banks can go under and some have. And the FDIC has promised they'd cover deposits up to 250 per person, 250,000 per person, even though they covered way more than that in the last round of bank failures. Uh, but this is as close as we can get to no risk is just bank accounts, right? Conservative means mostly fixed income, also known as bonds, CDs, money markets. You still might have some equity exposure if you're dubbed a conservative um, investor. Something to think about is, you know, a conservative account isn't going to fluctuate probably as much as a more aggressive account. It's also probably not going to earn as much over time. Um, the worst year for bonds in 45 years was actually last year, 2022. And the index for bonds went down 13%. That's a rep representation of the bond market. So that's kind of a worst case scenario is down 13%. Whereas equities, um, you know, in a bad year, like 07, 09, Great Recession, lost over 50%, five zero. So that's the difference in risk profile. Moderate is gonna be a mix of fixed income and equity. Aggressive is gonna be mostly equity. And then speculation, um, I have Bitcoin here. Bitcoin is not quite an investment yet, still really speculative. It might be one day. Another speculative, uh, maybe Beanie Babies, maybe tulips, you've heard of the tulip bubble, right? So that's speculation. And that's not something that we do here, <laughs> just FYI. Clients might do this on their own. We do not speculate at Financial Insights. Now, what investment mix should you have specifically? Well, the first step we're gonna go back to is that three to six month emergency fund. You have to have that, you have to, before we're gonna invest. Then we need to make sure that any goals you have with less than an 18 month time horizon are in cash or some form of cash. If you have a time horizon of at least five years for investments, that's different. Um, we want you to be able to invest if you have at least five years. Five years is just kind of a rule of thumb. Um, but if you have, you know, between 18 months and five years is, is that's when your goal lands. Let's think about a dynamic approach. Let's structure fixed income strategies, um, you know, or use a dynamic approach or a combination of the two. Dynamic means that you, that you are willing to bypass or delay that goal if you have bad market timing. So we just wanna make sure that if your goal is to buy a vacation home, you know, in 2028, well, we can go ahead and invest those funds, but if in 2028 we have a major recession, we're probably going to recommend that you don't sell, you know, your investments at a loss to buy this house. You have to be willing to maybe wait a few years till it recovers. If you are, then that's fine. You have a dynamic approach to that goal, um, and you're willing to delay it if you have bad market timing. And then if you have, you know, a fixed income strategy, that might be something like a bond CD ladder. It might be a mix of conservative investments. So there are ways to get you, you know, between that 18 and five, five year. Um, definitely think about matching your goals, your tax situation, your risk appetite, and your age to determine the appropriate mix. Um, meaning younger should be more aggressive, ideally. 
However, we do have some clients who are risk off and can't handle values fluctuating. That's true. We have some, some people who are admittedly very pessimistic about the future. Um, they don't believe in our economy, you know, this or that reason. And these clients should, first of all, save very aggressively. Um, and then maybe they aren't the best investor because we don't want that person to hurt themselves, you know, when the market goes down and, get, and gets nervous. Um, if you're an investor, that's an act in optimism. That's you saying, I'm investing in the future. If you don't believe we have a bright future, it might, you might, you know, it might be pretty hard for you to invest. Um, so if you want to know your kind of magic number for retiring, um, which is what gets some people to think about investing, you multiply your living expenses by 25. Um, that's something that I sometimes do as, as a fun exercise. And it can be used for our fire folks out there. That's uh, financial freedom, I think, retire early, something like that. <laughs> so for those folks, and you just want to get to a magic number and you're saving really aggressively, um, you can use that. Uh, next, if you're still that, you know, maybe a more conservative investor, don't want to be aggressive, but you're young, try attacking your debt, maybe invest in real estate, CDs, something other than bank accounts, because those are just going to go backwards to inflation. Um, that would be really sad if you just invested in savings. And then if you're older, you're not always more conservative. I've had 90-year-olds who are 100% stock because they wanted it that way. They didn't need to rely on their stock portfolio for income. Um, they want to aggress aggressively because it's fun or because they want to build a large estate to pass on to future generations. But I will tell you, if you're drawing 3 to 4%, which is the rule of thumb, from your portfolio for living expenses in retirement, you're, you're not really going to have, you're probably not going to have a choice, but to have a portion of your assets and fixed income to reduce that volatility. That's, that's probably going to have to be a component of your portfolio. There is something, you know, there is a such thing as being too aggressive while you're in the distribution phase. So um, that's what I'll say about your investment mix. Um, Younger is more aggressive, older is more conservative, but always with exceptions and always with a goals-based uh, idea. So let's talk about, you know, just to kind of tack on to why we invest, I picked 1958 to today. So 65 years ago, what were the price of goods versus today? The average price of a home was 10,450. Today in Tacoma, it's 473,000. This is why you can't have your money in a bank account. <laughs> Gas was 24 cents. Today it's five dollars and nine cents, although I just paid five dollars and fifteen cents this morning. Harvard tuition was one thousand two hundred fifty dollars a year. Today it's fifty-four thousand two sixty-nine. Um so that's why we invest. And last but not least, estate and insurance considerations um, by age. So 18 to 30, you want beneficiaries on all your accounts. You want to have some estate documents in line. That's your will, your power of attorney, um, your homeowner's insurance, health, car, life. Get your insurance dialed. Make sure you're covered there. Age 30 to 50, it's the same as 18 to 30, but make changes as your life changes, right? So maybe you have more, maybe you've had more kids. Um, maybe you need to consider trust because you've amassed a you know, greater amount of wealth. Um, if you're 50 to 100, updating estate documents to remove those who have passed away. That's a common update. Evaluating your life insurance need, evaluating long-term care, charity, Washington state estate tax, um, which is a big one. So the, the moral of the story here by each, I'll kind of go over each age again, is prepare for if something were to happen to you. It's just the adult thing to do. It's never fun to really talk about, um, but something that your financial planner can help you with. Um, estate documents at the very least, if you have kids, name a guardian for their care and for the finances. An executor of your will is the person who, um, who makes sure that your will is followed to a T when you pass away. And your power of attorney is someone that you trust for if you're incapacitated, but you are still alive. So that's the major difference between those two documents. Um, and then match your life insurance with your needs. In my, in my family, personally, I'm the only income provider. So my 30-year term policy 
is a lot higher than my husband's. I need a, I need a massive amount of life insurance for if something happened to me so that it takes care of them. Now, my husband needs life insurance too, because without him, who cares for my kids? I'd have to pay for that. I'd have to pay for a nanny. I'd have to, you know, so without him, um, I'm in trouble as well. So we both need life insurance. And, and it's important to do what I think is a needs analysis to determine how much you should have. Uh, and then save and invest adequately to remove the need one day, hopefully, right? So hopefully after this 30 years, I'm self-insured and I don't need life insurance anymore. Um, because I'm in a good spot. And then if you have, you know, good rule of thumb for life insurance too, is to just always go out 30 years, go out as long as you can, you can always stop paying, but it can be hard to get reinsured. You know, it can be hard if you have a health um, situation, or if your employer plan goes away, if you're fired or quit. Um, you know, it's a good idea to get a separate policy when it's inexpensive and when you're young. And we should think about trust. Like, um, like going through probate when you're alive. So who should consider a trust? Maybe not everybody, maybe not someone who's 18 and going to have so many life changes. It's going to be expensive to keep updating a trust, <laughs> but you should perk up if you have, um, you know, some of these situations. Uh, I would say if you have a couple million dollars or, or more, especially, or if you have a taxable estate in the state you live in. So for Oregon, if you have over a million dollars, they're going to tax um, when you pass away. They're going to tax the money over a million. In Washington State, we'll call it 2.2 million. Um, if you have a child with a disability, if you own a home outside of the state that you live in, uh, and then if there's a stipulation in inheritance, and a common one for that is divorce or kids from different parents. If we're not quite sure whose money was what and where it should go, uh, it's a good idea just to place your assets in a trust. Um, so that's what I'll say about estate and insurance considerations. And the last thing that I'll share with you because um, I've got three minutes and I still wanna make time for, for questions is that if I could turn back time, now I've been lucky to fall into this career and gain the knowledge I do about financial planning, but most don't and they don't know the basics. Uh, if that's you, please do not feel bad. I have CEOs and doctors who don't understand the basics of personal finance, not because they are not smart, because it is not taught in primary education, typically, and they don't find it interesting enough to study on their own. And that's fine. They have more important things to do, like save lives. So you probably do as well, uh, but you should know there are still some things that even I regret. And I'm going to come back to this <laughs> Roth idea and really drive it home. Um, because if I were to invest the money from my very first job at age 14, in a Roth IRA. That was my first consistent job. I cleaned four stalls at $2 per stall. There were 24 stalls in total, which would have gotten me $48 for the weekend. Now I didn't do this every single weekend, but if I did, that would have been $2,496 for the year. And if I would have invested it at that time into the S&P 500, it would be worth today $12,630. That's 406% or 7.47% per year on average. Now, remember, I would have been invested, you know, 0709, it would have been down 50%. You know, there would have been ups and downs. There's no consistent return like that when you're investing. Um, but that's a lot of money. And, and it's not maybe a lot of money today, but um, I can't predict what the future will be. So I went backwards and I said, okay, what if I was ready to retire today? So I was age 14 in 1972. Maybe I'm 65 today. In 1972, I invested my money into a Roth, that 2,496. That would have been $442,000 today, call it 443. And that would have been completely tax-free because I had put it in a Roth account. So, um, so anyway, if there's anything I can I can help drive home, it's that young people should have a Roth as much as they can. <laughs> and that is something that I truly regret. What did I buy with that $2 that I got per stall? Probably gum, you know, probably something like gum. So anyway, um, this can help um, your young people. If you have young people who are age 
14 as an example, but who are working and have their first job. I've heard of, uh, I have one client who she tells her grandchildren she will match anything they save in an investment account as long as they invest and save until at least age 18. So she'll invest for them and she'll match it. So they're kind of getting skin in the game, right? If someone would have done that with me, I guarantee I would have taken them up on it. And it could have been huge. And remember with a Roth, it doesn't have to be for retirement. In a true emergency, a Roth can distribute the principal without penalty. So maybe my first home that I ever bought and the roof leaks, I have a backup account I can go to. Um, so anyway, um, especially because, you know, I'm the kind of person I don't have my mom or dad bailing me out if I have an emergency, okay? <laughs> my own saving and my own everything is from my own efforts. Um, and that's what you can do for your kids too. And it teaches self-sufficiency. So, um, so yeah. That's what I'll say. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, do we have any questions that we can answer quickly? I'll open it up. And if we don't, that's okay. That's great. That means you're all CFP experts. <laughs> or I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Amanda, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. And um, we have reached our four o'clock to answer any questions that you'd like to have for her. Um, if there isn't any at the current moment, feel free to unmute um, to answer your questions. If not, thank you for attending our Wisdom with Women this year with Amanda Burroughs. You did a great job. Thank you for speaking to us. And Please check us out in the fall for Dorothy Lewis's Medicare seminar, which will be plopped right in the middle of Medicare open enrollment, October 15th through um, December. So if you have any questions, feel free to stick around. Amanda will hang out for a few minutes. And if not, it was great to see you today. Thanks for attending. Well, and Ali, should we have, you know, if people want to ask a question?